Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Roger Frechette, and I would like to welcome you to the next installment of Interface Engineering's High Performance Buildings uh, free webinar series. Uh, today is a discussion about an introduction uh, to geothermal systems. Uh, so to start, uh, just an introduction of myself. Uh, again, uh, my name is Roger Frechette, Managing Principal of Interface Engineering. I have 35 years experience in the engineering design within the built environment uh, with many projects uh, throughout the United States and around the world uh, with a particular focus on high performing design, uh, low energy, low carbon, uh, near zero and net zero energy buildings. Uh, my firm uh, Interface Engineering is a 51 year old uh, MEP engineering firm with seven offices across the United States, including uh, my home office in Washington, D.C., uh, which was opened up uh, roughly seven and a half uh, years ago. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, get just into a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping items. Uh, one is that uh, this project uh, will be AIA accredited and will provide one uh, learning unit. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the number uh, from the AIA just yet. We expect it this week. And uh, my uh, assistant, assistant uh, Emily Williams, will uh, will make sure that anybody who uh, is interested in obtaining that learning unit, uh, uh, you can email her and, um, and we'll make sure that you get the information uh, so that you get that uh, credit. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to jump right into uh, jump right into the topic. Uh, so I'll, I won't read word for word uh, the course description, but today is an introduction uh, to uh, geothermal uh, systems and technologies. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the history, the science. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about specific applications, and uh, we're going to uh, even at the end uh, talk about a, a case study just to give an example of how we expect these types of systems to be uh, utilized uh, within, within the very near future. The learning objectives, uh, again, is to uh, recap on the history. We're gonna go back uh, 10,000 years, if not more. Uh, we're gonna talk about a very wide range of applications of, of geothermal systems, not just in the, the built environment, but uh, in many different industries. Uh, thirdly, we're going to talk about uh, how these technologies uh, can be uh, applied uh, to, to in various conditions and uh, the impact that it uh, can have on energy consumption, water consumption, and, and carbon footprint. And then, uh, and then again, we'll, we'll talk about how uh, these systems can be used uh, in our homes, uh, in our businesses, in our communities. So we got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, no pun intended, um, but it is uh, all about the ground. It's all about the earth. Uh, geothermal is is uh, energy that comes from the from the earth, uh, as opposed to from the wind or the sun or or other uh, fossil fuel burning means. Uh, most people consider uh, geothermal a renewable energy source. I, I might challenge that a little bit through the course of uh, today's discussion. I think it is mostly renewable and maybe entirely renewable in certain applications but but not others but uh, we will get into that and we'll start with a discussion of uh, geology the geology behind uh, geothermal systems all right so uh, to understand geothermal uh, energy you need to understand how the earth is put together uh, we have a crust a mantle an outer core an inner uh, iron core and um, and at each level, uh, the conditions and temperatures and and energy uh, content is is considerably different. Uh, now, in general, uh, the Earth's crust can range anywhere between five to twenty-five miles deep before you get to what is referred to as the mantle. And to get through the mantle, you would need to travel about uh, one thousand eight hundred miles. So you could imagine if you wanted to go straight down into the earth, penetrate the earth's mantle, uh, it's about the equivalent of, of uh, going from uh, you know, Florida from, uh, to California. 
uh, straight down. Uh, apologize for uh, ringing devices. Uh, but uh, what, one a very important thing to note here is, is when you, um, uh, on the left-hand side, the crust looks like a very even covering uh, over the earth. But in reality, the thickness of the crust uh, can vary uh, quite substantially. Uh, the crust in locations where you have mountain ranges can be up to 100 kilometers uh, in depth. And in some locations, it can get near or close to zero, uh, where uh, the crust is very thin or, or absent uh, altogether. And uh, you know, I kind of equate it to, uh, to some degree, uh, the way that a, a uh, an M&M uh, peanut uh, candy might be put together. And some of the terms we'll use are uh, uh, litho lithosphere and athensophere. So the uh, lithosphere is essentially the hard, sweet candy coating uh, that covers the M&M. Uh, it, uh, it is solid in nature, but not particularly thick. It, uh, and look at the overall composition, it is very, very thin. And it is composed of not only the crust, but the solid portion of the uh, upper mantle. When you get uh, inside of that, you have the asthenosphere. And the asthenosphere is the much thicker, uh, much softer, and uh, much tastier <laughs> element to, uh, to, to the peanut candy. Uh, so you can imagine uh, in, uh, in a perfectly uniform condition, uh, the asthenosphere would always stay hidden by that, that protective shell. Um, the problem is uh, our earth is not uh, stagnant. It is constantly moving and the pieces and parts are shifting and we have plates that are pushing together and pulling apart and creating fissures and fractures and cracks in that uh, upper a solid uh, portion of the mantle and even in the crust. And that allows uh, the molten core, uh, that portion of the asthenosphere, to penetrate and crack through and, and expose uh, itself to, uh, to the Earth's surface and to the, to the bottoms of our oceans. And this is happening due to uh, plate tectonics. So there are a number of large uh, plates uh, across the world and they are constantly shifting. North America, for example, is pulling away from uh, from uh, Europe and from Africa. Their, their plates are, are, are literally opening up uh, gaps uh, under the ocean. Uh, at the same time, the, the North American plate is, is uh, sliding along the Pacific plate and that obviously has caused issues uh, on the west coast of the United States uh, with uh, earthquakes and, and other um, a geological activity uh, uh, such as Mount St. Helens and, and, and the like. Uh, so uh, if, if you were to kind of zoom in and look at what this movement of the plates is doing just in uh, Southern California between Los Angeles and San Diego, it creates a, a very large number of uh, fault lines where we can see a lot of this uh, um, you know, the, this uh, geological activity going on. Uh, San Andreas, uh, I guess, is the most uh, popular, the one we hear most about. Uh, however, it is just one of many, many uh, fault lines that exist as you ride along that Pacific coast. So another outcome uh, from these fissures and cracks and shifting is uh, the emergence of uh, hot springs. And that is where, again, this hotter molten rock is coming closer to the surface and is actually coming in contact with groundwater and is heating, in some case, even boiling uh, that water uh, as it uh, rises uh, up to the, the surface. Uh, you compare the East Coast to the West Coast, uh, there are a few hot springs uh, along the East Coast, along the Appalachian uh, Ridge. Uh, however, most of them exist along that uh, Pacific coast. And again, it's due to the action from the plate tectonics. So how does this, uh, how does this lead to a discussion on geothermal and the history of geothermal? Uh, I would say that geothermal uh, science, geothermal energy, and the use of geothermal 
energy is really an American story. And, and here's why I'm, uh, I'm making that case. Uh, 10, 15,000 years ago, uh, the world was a different place. Uh, there was a lot more snow and ice on the land. Uh, and, um, and as a result, uh, the oceans were shallower and uh, there was a lot more land mass uh, on the earth. And if you look at the area currently uh, between Russia and Canada, uh, that area is known as the Bering Strait that separates the Pacific Ocean from the Arctic Ocean. Uh, back then, 15,000 years ago, this was a uh, land mass. You could walk from one side to the other. And humans did. Uh, for the first time, uh, the area currently known as the United States uh, had uh, humans uh, that were migrating. Uh, these were known as the Clovis people. Uh, they're estimated to have come across uh, this uh, land area called Berenia about 15,000 years ago and began to populate uh, mostly areas along uh, the, the west coast uh, of the United States. Uh, they predominantly hunted elk and woolly mammoth and, and, and bison, and, and that's how they survived while they were moving. But eventually they needed to, to settle. And as they, they settled, they needed to pick a good location. So this, this group of Clovis people became uh, the very first uh, American Indians. And one of the most popular places that they would settle was in and around these hot springs, uh, you know, along uh, the Pacific coast in what is now California, Oregon, uh, Northwestern Wyoming. And the reason they did that is these hot springs provided uh, a great way for them to uh, cook food, uh, to, to bathe, uh, to wash, uh, and even to uh, help to keep their, their homes warm during the, the colder months of the year. So the, through the course of the next uh, 1,000 to 1,200 years, uh, this population expanded and, and, and grew uh, to a very large uh, group of, uh, of American Indians, uh, Native American Indians, and many different tribes uh, from the East Coast to, to the West Coast. Uh, but then something happened. Uh, in 1492, uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Uh, the Europeans came to uh, North America and uh, began to claim the land as, as their own. And through the course of only about 50 or 60 years, uh, the population uh, in North America of American Indians dropped from nearly 22 million people uh, to less than 3 million people. And uh, through the course of uh, 100 years, uh, dropped uh, to only about a million people. So uh, this was the, the most horrific, the most comprehensive, the most sustained example of genocide uh, in all of recorded world history and, and human civilization. And it all happened uh, right in our backyard. Uh, however, fortunately, uh, it was not uh, a complete genocide and then some of, uh, of the population did survive uh, and, and continue to rely on these uh, geothermal hot springs. Uh, in the American West and the American uh, Northwest. So that's some of the history. The very first documented use of geothermal uh, was by uh, these, these Indians on the, on the West Coast of the United States. And since then, uh, the use of geothermal has expanded uh, quite uh, dramatically. And this chart shows uh, all the different uses uh, that uh, we could come across of, of how geothermal is used uh, in the United States. So you see the middle of the chart, uh, that sort of yellow area. Uh, those are temperatures uh, that you know usually hover around 200 degrees Fahrenheit. That that's about the temperature that you would have found uh, in these hot springs back even you know a thousand years ago. And uh, and some of the uses of this water is still used for the same thing. Used it's still used for uh, for for cooking. It's still used. Uh, for um, helping to prepare foods and for drying meat. Uh, but uh, the, the two main examples that I'm gonna pick to talk about today are really on the, on the outer boundaries, on the far right-hand side and the far left-hand side because they are the most widespread use of, of geothermal in, in our business. On the far right, we're gonna talk about one form of geothermal and that is to produce electricity uh, through power plants. 
And on the far left, we're going to talk about geothermal heat pumps, uh, also known as uh, geoexchange. And uh, that's uh, perhaps where uh, we as architects and engineers and, and owners and builders on the East Coast are, are going to see the largest uh, number of examples of, of geothermal energy. So starting with geothermal power plants, uh, here's a map that was uh, developed by uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL. And what it shows, is it shows the, the, the potential for using geothermal for power production in the United States. And, and it all has to do with how uh, far down you can reasonably drill and then what the temperature of the earth is at that particular depth. So where you see those hot red spots, uh, that's where the real opportunity exists. And actually the black dots represent, uh, represent actual uh, geothermal installations. So when you're in one of those hot spots, if you were to drill down between five to 10 kilometers, uh, you would see temperatures that range anywhere between 400 and 700 degrees Fahrenheit. If you look over on our side of the country, uh, you see uh, uh, right across to Washington, D.C., that sort of green band that stretches from, from Vermont all the way down into Florida, and it says N.A. And what that means is that in test borings, where they have drilled down 10 kilometers into the earth, they haven't even been able to come across the ground temperatures that reach 150 degrees, which is not particularly useful for, for power generation. So uh, as a result, um, there are, compared to other countries, a significant number of geothermal installations in the U.S., but uh, they all tend to be clustered in a very small area on the west coast of the U.S., with some up in Alaska as well. Now, when you're drilling uh, these, uh, you know, for these geothermal systems, th this is, this is a, a, a significant uh, effort to drill down. Uh, we're talking about going down roughly six to seven miles down into the earth uh, for a single uh, borehole. That's very timely uh, and a very expensive activity. And for these power plants, uh, you need not just one uh, hole, but uh, a number of boreholes to be able to make uh, these systems work. So here's a, a diagram of a typical geothermal power plant. Uh, the red vertical lines that you see are the production wells. That's literally taking water out of the ground, uh, again, as uh, up to some, well, between three kilometers and 10 kilometers deep and pulling that very hot water up to the surface, uh, pulling the energy from that water and then re-injecting the somewhat cooler water back into the ground. The reinjection is important because you do not want to dry out the uh, ground at that point. You need the liquid to be able to pull out uh, and, and put back in. Uh, as part of the process, some of that water is lost to the atmosphere and vapor. So you'll see two, um, I guess, brown colored lines on the far left and far right where uh, excess water uh, is generally pumped into the ground to make up for the, the steam that is lost to the atmosphere. Uh, and then at the surface, uh, you have uh, the need to, um, you know, to exchange the heat, to generate the power, uh, to condense the steam, uh, and again, water reservoirs to, to make up the, the lost water within the system. You know, so uh, if you look at one of these plants, again, they're substantial installations, and, and, but, but from an engineering standpoint, it's, it's, it's really quite simple. Uh, again, uh, in the, if you can see my cursor, as the energy is pulled through the earth, you have very high temperature water between four and 700 degrees. Uh, that temperature is uh, transferred uh, through a heat exchanger and somewhat cooler water comes out of the heat exchanger, still under pressure. Uh, we don't want it to really flash into steam and is re-injected, is pumped back into the into the ground. It's important to keep it as a liquid under pressure because you can pump water, uh, but you cannot pump a, a gas such as steam. Uh, the energy from that is transferred to a essentially a, a closed loop system here where you end up uh, getting water that turns into superheated steam through the heating process, which then feeds into a turbine 
that turbine generates the electricity that we're looking for. The uh, input to this turbine is high pressure steam. What comes out of the turbine is low pressure steam. That low pressure steam needs to go into a condenser because again, we can't pump the steam. And then cooling towers are used to further cool that steam into a liquid. And that liquid is then pumped back into the heat exchanger and the process repeats itself uh, over and over again. Now to look at the actual components, this is what uh, a typical heat exchanger in a geothermal plant might look like. They're massive. It's a shell and tube type heat exchanger where the tubes of, uh, of hot liquid are in the middle and then the, uh, and on the outer portion, the water is allowed to, to heat up to that superheated steam and then go to the turbine. Here's what a typical turbine might look like. Again, this, the high pressure steam is used to to spin the blades on a turbine, uh, which rotates within a magnet, which which produces the electricity. These are what the condenser units are look uh, look like. Again, they're just cooling down that low pressure steam back into a liquid to be pumped, and then the energy uh, to cool them down is uh, is done using cooling towers. You're essentially taking the heat out of that low pressure steam and releasing that heat to the atmosphere. So here's an example of what a, uh, a, a uh, relatively small uh, geothermal installation looks like. Uh, this is one in Iceland. And um, you know you, you can sort of see geothermal activity coming through the ground uh, in the surrounding areas. Uh, but this particular uh, installation can generate uh, approximately 120 megawatts of, of power. And what you don't see in this image is the, the big cooling towers. And the reason for that is rather than releasing all that heat to the atmosphere, uh, they're taking that heat and they're, they're heating up water, domestic water. So the plant also generates about 17,400 gallons per minute of hot water that is used to heat the buildings uh, in the nearby town. The biggest uh, installation of geothermal power plant in the entire world is right here in the United States. Uh, in California, right out in that same region that we were talking about, uh, you know, where that tectonic uh, activity was taking place. But this is the uh, Geysers Geothermal Power Station, and it is capable of producing 1,517 megawatts of, of power. And again, it is the largest uh, such plant uh, in the world. So this diagram shows uh, where these installations are, are happening. And again, it's, it's mostly California, Nevada, uh, Oregon, Idaho. Uh, and in the white, it shows what's currently installed. And what's shown in, in yellow is the, the planned uh, upcoming projects. And you can see in a place like Nevada, where they currently have 426 megawatts and they're, they're uh, expecting to go to around 3,700, there is substantial uh, increases in the planned production uh, in that state uh, over the over the next couple of years. So flipping to the other side of the chart, we're now going to talk about um, a, a completely different form of geothermal called geoexchange and geoexchange mechanical systems. And when we talk about geothermal projects uh, in our region in the Middle Atlantic, these are the systems we're talking about. We're not talking about you know, pulling uh, heat out of the ground uh, at high temperatures for, for producing uh, power. We're talking about a connection to buildings, mechanical HVAC systems. So the reason this works, uh, and, and I would say where it, uh, where it works best is when you have conditions where you have both a, a heating season and a cooling season for your buildings. When you look at uh, what's going on above the Earth's surface, uh, the home or business or office building or wh whatever the element is that you're trying to heat or cool is experiencing uh, large changes in outside air temperatures through the course of the year. You know, so in this particular area, we can certainly we certainly have seen days when it's been zero degrees Fahrenheit outside the winter time. The same time we've seen days that it's 95 degrees. Uh, in the summertime. And whatever that outside air temperature is, if it stays that way for any prolonged period of time, the, um, 
the, the, the building is going to want to try to achieve equilibrium, meaning if you don't heat it or cool it, eventually it's going to reach that, that same temperature. However, when you look into the ground, uh, and again, these are numbers that are specific to this region, when you go down, not too far down into the earth, the temperature of the ground is roughly 55 degrees, you know, during the summer and during the winter. And that stable mass of, of energy that can be connected to uh, is what allows for us to use these systems uh, to both uh, heat and cool uh, buildings uh, through the course of the entire year. And again, you don't need to go uh, that far down. If you, if you look at that purple line, for example, uh, that's six inches into the ground. And at six inches to the into the ground, you can see, uh, and again, this is for this region, you can see quite a change uh, through the course of the year. It can be as warm as, you know, 63, 64 degrees and as cold as freezing. Uh, and uh, we, we do see ground frost uh, from from time to time you go further north than here and that ground frost layer gets thicker and thicker you, you go up into vermont and maine and you can have three feet of of frozen ground below 32 degrees uh, in the middle of the winter time uh, however when you go down two feet or five feet you go only 12 feet into the ground and you can see there's very little change uh, when you go from summer and winter and then you go down 50 feet and you're pretty much stable 55 degrees uh, throughout the course of the year. And again, those ground temperatures, I'm saying 55 degrees because that's the number that roughly that we see here in the Washington DC area. Uh, however, if you were in Southern Florida, that number would be 77 degrees. And if you were uh, in Bar Harbor, Maine, that number would be closer to 42 degrees. So it, it really does become very much dependent upon specifically where you are not only uh, and, and critical uh, elements are not only what the temperature of the ground is but what the, the ground is is made of you know is it is it sand is it clay you know is it uh, you know is it bedrock you know you, you take bedrock for example bedrock can be good and bad the, the good thing about bedrock is it's a very conductive of material and it's very easy to exchange energy with the bad side of bedrock is it can be very difficult and expensive to drill through. So, so, uh, so for a heat exchange uh, heat pump system, this is a very, very simplistic diagram. And essentially it's working in, in two basic modes through the course of the year. It's either heating and cooling. So uh, this is a winter scene. So in the winter time, you're heating the building, which means you're adding heat to the air. As you're adding heat to the air, it's gotta come from somewhere and that heat is coming from a refrigeration loop. And as that refrigeration loop is given up its heat, it needs to get its heat from somewhere and it comes from the ground. So as you're soaking up heat from the ground, the ground is actually cooling down. And then in the summertime, that effect reverses and now you are absorbing heat from the house, putting it into the refrigerant, which then goes into the loop uh, and then uh, you know, as you're putting into the loop, it then is, is passed along to the groundwater and the ground becomes warmer. So it's reverse. When you're cooling the building, you're heating the ground. When you're heating the building, you're cooling the ground. That's, that's a very simplistic uh, explanation of what's happening. In a perfectly balanced system, the amount of heat that you're adding to the ground in the, uh, in the uh, summertime is exactly equal to the heat that you're pulling out of the ground in the wintertime. Unfortunately, it's very rare to see a, a perfectly balanced system, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. So we'll talk about the inside bits and parts you know, of a system like this. So this is a picture of a geo-exchange heat pump, the device, uh, the main device that would go into your home or into your business. Very exciting looking. It is essentially a, a sheet metal box with uh, with openings for water in and out and uh, openings for air and that to come in and out. If you were to peek inside uh, that sheet metal box, you know, essentially here's what you would see. You know, you have a coil, uh, you have a compressor, uh, you have a series of valves, bypass valves, expansion valves, reversing valves. And you also have, you know, one or two uh, heat exchangers in there. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if you are in the cooling mode, you're essentially de delivering a very cold liquid to your coil. Uh, that coil is 
is absorbing heat from the air as it does that liquid becomes a gas and that gas then needs to be compressed so you essentially added heat that's turned that into a gas when you get into the other side of 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 the uh the, the cycle here you've got to give up that heat into the ground loop uh, and it does through this heat exchanger and as that heat goes back into the ground loop you're cooling the refrigerant back down and it goes again it goes from being a vapor back to a liquid again and the process keeps repeating itself and as you're doing that again your ground is getting warmer and warmer when you go into heating mode uh, essentially a valve does in fact reverse so now you have a condition where you have hot vapor uh, that is going into your coil and all that heat is being passed into the airstream uh, as you're pulling all that heat out of the refrigerant it condenses and it becomes a liquid and then when you come on to the other side of the equation here you have uh, you have uh, the um, the need to pull some heat out of the ground because you've cooled off this liquid so so as this liquid then becomes a vapor again you are uh, losing temperature in the ground. And again, in a balanced system, those two things would equal out over the course of the year. Oh, I, I should say one other thing you see in the middle here, and this is not in all systems, this is an option. You see what's called a desuperheater. If you have a condition where there's too much heat in the overall system, for example, if you were in the Southern part of the United States and you're doing a lot more cooling than heating it means you're looking to put a lot more heat into the ground than you want to one way to offset that is you can add a domestic a connection to your domestic hot water heating system and you can pull heat out of the cycle and use it uh, for the purposes of of, uh, of creating hot water and again that helps to not necessarily bring the whole system into balance but to have it more balanced than it might otherwise be so here's what one of those systems might look like in your house. Again, here is your geothermal heat pump. Uh, there is a, a desuperheater heat exchanger in it, and it's put directly adjacent to a domestic hot water tank, and, and that process is used in part to heat uh, the hot water uh, for the, the domestic hot water for the, for the home. So uh, it looks kind of boring uh, from an inside standpoint. When you get outside, it's a little bit more interesting. Uh, there's uh, a number of options of what you can do to be able to exchange the energy from the heat pump uh, to the ground. And this diagram shows the, the four sort of fundamental systems that, 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 that are used. Uh, one is an open loop system where you're literally pumping water out of the ground through an open well uh, through the heat pump and then returning that uh, to a separate well. Uh, the second to the right of that is what is called a closed loop uh, uh, horizontal system where the piping uh, sits very close to the to the earth's surface. Uh, the third is a closed loop uh, vertical system uh, similar to the horizontal system but but now rather than spreading out over a large area you're you're drilling down uh, much deeper into the ground. Uh, vertically. And then the last one in the lower right hand corner is a closed loop pond or lake system where rather than exchanging the energy with the, the dirt, with the earth, uh, you're exchanging it to a body of water, which um, can have its own sort of complications and unless you completely own and control <laughs> that, uh, that body of water. So here's some pictures of the closed loop horizontal system where the pipe is very close to the surface. They have these coils, or I, I like to call them slinky systems, and you don't have to dig very far down into the ground to install them. Uh, how far you have to go down largely has to do with where you are and again, how cold it gets. You can see the system on the right-hand side is much deeper than the left, and uh, that's because this, uh, you know, this installation is much further north, so the frost layer extends a much deeper uh, into the ground. Uh, these can be put in in a very cost-effective way if you're in a location where the ground doesn't freeze. Uh, if you were in Florida, Georgia, Texas, uh, you could cut a very narrow trench, which is a very cost-effective way to excavate and drop these loops in uh, sort of on their side and cover them back up. 
So very large uh, systems could be installed uh, very quickly and, uh, and fairly cheaply. Uh, here's a couple images of the pond or lake system, again, where you're literally submerging these slinkies. And that pipe material is what's, uh, well, there's a couple different um, uh, materials that are used. One is called uh, HPDE, the um, or HDPE, high-density polyethylene uh, material. And uh, the other pipe material that is often used is, is called PEX or PEX-A uh, material. Uh, the the high-density polyethylene is uh, generally uh, a more cost-effective way. It's generally a, a cheaper uh, material. It's not quite as durable as the PEX, but it's the difference between a uh, hundred year life and a hundred and twenty year life. So most people go with the 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 uh, high density polyethylene. Uh, so it's literally submerged in the water, and the heat is transferred to the to the body of water. So in the open loop system, again, you're you're literally pumping uh, the water out. Uh, this is different from the other systems. In the other systems, the water that goes through the loops never actually comes into uh, contact uh, or uh, is never uh, coming in contact with the mechanical system it, itself. Uh, there's always a heat exchange element, but here the water is drawn uh, directly into the mechanical equipment. So uh, one of the real downsides to this uh, type of equipment is they are prone to fouling and corrosion. Uh, the water can have much different uh, pH levels and, and can have uh, you know, calcium, it, it can have a lot of minerals in it that, that can clog up the system over time. So we don't see too many of those type of systems. The most popular system that we see and, uh, and have designed and installed in this region is what's called the closed loop vertical system. Uh, so piping uh, goes into the ground, uh, but the water that circulates uh, uh, through the, um, you know, through this piping uh, the water itself never touches the ground. It's just a heat exchange between the ground and the fluid that is within the pipe. So you, you usually end up with multiple boreholes. Uh, the depth of the borehole, again, the, the, is completely dependent upon how much energy you need to extract and the geology and, and the, the price of, of drilling uh, in that particular location. But you generally end up with a pipe that goes down into the ground, somewhere between 150 and 400 feet, depending upon the application. Uh, and uh, and that, that, uh, that hole that is drilled, the pipe is put in there, and then it is filled with a grout. And the energy is really transferred from the ground to the grout, and then from the grout to, to the liquid that is within the pipe. So um, you know, a couple different uh, versions of this, but you will always have at least one inlet and one outlet as the pipe goes down the ground, turns around and comes back. Again, this shows uh, that piping being uh, surrounded by uh, this poured grout. So if you can imagine, it's really this, this grout formation, this, this column uh, of, uh, of, of solid uh, grout uh, that extends into the earth. It's really that grout that is is exchanging energy with the with the ground temperatures. Another issue or problem or challenge with closed loop vertical systems is you are heating or cooling the ground directly adjacent to the well. If you put the wells too close together, they can interact in a negative way, meaning uh, one well could be stealing energy from the other well. So they need to be maintained at an appropriate distance. And, uh, and again, that exact distance uh, can differ depending upon uh, the, uh, the, the, the geology of, of the ground. But, but generally speaking, most people use 20 feet as an appropriate uh, distance between wells. So if, you, if this were not a single family home, but if this were an office building, you would need a, a much larger number of wells. And when you space those wells out, you can see that um, you know, it can take up uh, some, some real estate. So just to try to put this into perspective, if I were to take a typically sized American football field, uh, you know, that the, the area of that field with uh, the surrounding team areas is about 64,000 square feet. And when you put 20 foot well spacing, like the diagram I just showed, it means you need about 213 square feet 
around each well. So this football field then could, uh, you could place 300 wells uh, underneath this field. And at a 300 foot depth, you'd probably get about 20,000 BTUs or six MBTUs. So you could get about 500 tons of heating or cooling out of a system that was installed under a football field. I'm using a football field because a lot of our geothermal projects uh, tend to be with schools uh, and high schools and uh, high schools almost always have a football field and it's a good way of gauging of what you can do with that field and how much energy you can get from it. So if you think about a football field equals 500 tons, you know, hopefully that'll give you a sort of a mental image of what the potential of a, of a site might be. And again, there's, there's a lot of variables in there. It won't be exactly 500 tons, it might be a little bit more, it might be a little bit less, but, but roughly speaking, that's a good rule of thumb. So you have all these pipes, uh, you, you have that supply and the return uh, coming out of uh, each well, they all need to be um, brought together. And, and uh, this is done through a, through a, um, uh, through a, a system of, of, of headers, and those can be done in a, in a linear uh, installation, or they can be done in a, a radial installation on the left-hand side. So there's a lot of options, but you're essentially pulling all that energy together into a into one supply and return that would go to the building. So um, usually at the very top, when you drill a hole, there's a metal sleeve that goes in down a, a few feet. You'll, you'll see here those black pipes on the right hand side with the red and the blue and the, there's not one in and one out there's actually two so this is a what's called double u bend configuration you, you literally have two loops within the same uh borehole but then you see they have this uh this truck here that's pumping the grout uh into uh into the borehole that is surrounding those uh high density poly polyethylene pipes now the grout that is used uh is really important uh, not all grouts are created equal. Uh, so uh, the grout that uh, we think makes most sense is a thermally conductive high performance grout that is usually uh, a mixture that contains um, um, poly, um, uh, what, uh, 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 geez, I can't remember the name of it, uh, which uh, uh, has um, uh, fibers uh, within the grout uh, to help with the heat exchange process. So when you look at this thermally enhanced grout compared to using wet gravel or just regular concrete or, or cement, there, there's a significant difference. Just by picking the right grout, you could uh, decrease the amount of, 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 of uh, vertical drilling by 10, 20, even 30%. Uh, now the offset to that is this thermally enhanced grout uh, can be expensive. You know, so studies really need to be done to optimize uh, the depth of drilling, you know, versus the number of boreholes, uh, versus the, the ROI uh, using uh, various uh, grout materials. So there's a lot, of, a lot of calculations that go into really optimizing these systems. And I also do want to point out, this is a messy process. You know, people think about, you know, the, the, the holes themselves that are being drilled are only about 10 or 12 inches in diameter. You know, but uh, what gets, but when you drill, you know, 300, 350, 400 feet into the earth, you're, you're pulling up a lot of stuff, a lot of, a, a lot of, um, of rock and, and, and water and clay. And it's a very, uh, it can be a very, very messy process. There's another uh, image from, from one of our projects. So I've only got a few minutes left. I, I, I'd just like to talk briefly about one case study. And I, I like to offer this study because I think it, it uh, shows where the, the science and application of, uh, of geo exchange systems uh, should be going and I think are going uh, within the United States. Uh, so this case study is a project that's actually located in Maynard, Texas. It's called uh, Whisper Valley. So it's a, a brand new community of homes, uh, mostly single family homes and, and town homes. And the intent of this development is that it's a highly sustainable uh, place to live. Uh, and uh, the, the, the goal uh, for the community is to be what's called net zero energy ready. Uh, 
all of the homes in the community have PV uh, solar panels on the roof. Uh, every home has Google Fiber so that, you know, to encourage people to, to work from home. Uh, every home is uh, very well insulated with, with excellent uh, uh, performing glass. Um, um, many of the homes have, uh, have uh, recharging stations for electric vehicles. Uh, there's uh, organic uh, uh, urban farming uh, spread throughout, lots of hiking, nature, biking trails for exercise. Uh, but from our perspective, there's also a very significant uh, geo exchange system uh, being installed. Uh, the overall development when done is going to be uh, nearly 8,000 homes and they are currently in their, their second uh, phase of development. Uh, so what's shown here is just one of the phases and, and it's home lots. I think there's 268 single family home lots altogether, a combination of both uh, single family home and, and town home installations. And we started the process by really looking at uh, the homes themselves and the loads, the heating and cooling loads that would be seen in the home and, and making recommendations for improving that through better roof insulation, better wall insulation, better windows, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the best uh, performing electrical appliances they could find. And, and then also looking at solar orientation of the homes. There's only so much you can do there uh, when you're building along a, a residential street, you know, but, uh, but uh, we, we uh, worked uh, closely uh, with the client to uh, make sure that the, the home itself uh, had a very low uh, energy footprint to, to it. You see in the lower right-hand corner, this is Texas, so the gray area is how much energy is required for cooling, and this little orange area is the uh, what is required for space heating. So definitely not a balanced system. We had a condition where the requirement for cooling energy far outweighed the requirement for heating energy. You still needed to do both, but um, but it was not uh, balanced in, in any way. So uh, this graph sort of illustrates that. On the left-hand side, that shows the cooling energy required for a typical home through the course of one year. And on the left side, the heating energy for a whole year. So other than just a couple of months uh, in the year, there was really no uh, requirement for heating uh, in these homes. So the first approach uh, when they uh, said they were interested in geothermal was to say, okay, we will put wells um, at the homes and those wells will be capable of providing sufficient heating and cooling uh, for those homes. And the problem is uh, that, you know, there are limitations on how far you can dig economically. Here we determined we could go 350 foot deep, uh, but we studied the energy that could come out of the ground. And this is done uh, through what's called conductivity testing. And with the energy that we could get out of a 350 foot well, we discovered in almost every case, we would need two geothermal wells uh, for each, uh, for each uh, plot, each single family plot. The townhomes, we could probably get away with one, but we would do two everywhere else. So this one phase of development would require 490 boreholes and economically that just didn't work. So we had to abandon uh, that approach. The other problem with doing that is, is when a home is interacting with its well, again, in, in Texas, where we are adding so much heat to the ground because we're cooling most of the time, that over the course of time, we could model what is gonna happen to the temperature of the ground. And, and this chart here shows the expected change to that ground temperature over a 20 year uh, period of time. Now, as the ground temperature gets warmer and warmer and warmer, the system will continue to cool and will continue to maintain the, the temperature within the homes. The problem is the higher the centering water temperature becomes, the less energy efficient the system becomes. So on day one, the system would have excellent efficiency, but slowly, slowly over time, that efficiency would be lost. And that is also, uh, you know, a, a problem that we were facing. Yeah. So then we had the notion of what if uh, we connected all the well fields together and connected all the homes uh, together? Well, by doing that, we would have the advantage of being able to uh, 
to, to really take advantage of the diversity in the system. Not all homes will be occupied at the same time. People will be on vacation. People will set the thermostats back. Homes are different orientations, so they're not peaking at the same uh, time during the day. And homes are in a real estate development aren't even necessarily built all at the same time. Sometimes it takes you know, uh, years uh, to, to fully build out completely a home development. And, and while that's happening, there's a lot of energy that could be shared from one home to the other. Okay? Uh, and this is a, a simple diagram of what a conventional geothermal field would work. Again, one of the problems with this is we still have to deal with the fact that there is uh, so much more heat going into the ground uh, than coming out over the course of the year. So uh, one step from that is to go with what is called a hybrid approach where you introduce cooling towers uh, into the system. By, by doing so, uh, you can shave the peak of, uh, of, of the overall profile of the community. Uh, which means you can reduce the number of wells. Uh, but in addition, you can use those cooling towers to recharge the ground to slow that process of what is called saturation, slow that process of the ground heating up over time. So this is kind of a diagram of, of what that would look like. Uh, so where we would have needed 490 wells, now we would be able to reduce it to 268 wells. That had a huge uh, economic advantage. The problem here, if you look at this well field, you know this would be again, a, you know, approximately a, a football field worth worth of well fields. And if I go back to this diagram, we don't we did not have the land area uh, to to install uh, that that size of a, a well field. Uh, so we took it one step further and said, well, what if we took this well field and distributed it uh, throughout the entire community, where rather than putting uh, two wells on every site because we don't need to anymore because they're connected. We put one well field uh, in each home site and we don't need that large uh, separate geothermal field. Uh, so that's what we ended up doing. And here you'll, you'll see this is one uh, uh, borehole drilling uh, that's associated with one home site. And then if you look a little bit further into the distance, you can see the next one, which is the adjacent uh, home sites, singular uh, borehole uh, connection. So in very simple terms, uh, what you see at the top of the diagram is the house and the blue box represents the heat pump that is inside the house. The little red circle represents the one singular borehole, 350 foot deep with a double U bend uh, that is on that person's piece of property. And then the yellow box represents the supply and return uh, district lines that uh, uh, connect all the homes uh, together. And it's really three different uh, interconnecting type of loops that make the system work. The first is a neighborhood loop. So along your street, uh, you are connected by pipes through a, through a loop uh, to all the other homes uh, on your particular street. And that creates your neighborhood loop. And then each of the individual mini districts are then connected to a, a another loop, which is your which is your district loop, uh, your district cooling loop. So now not only do you have the ability to share energy between homes that are along your particular street, your mini district, your neighborhood has the ability to share energy with other neighborhoods that are going to have that are going to be peaking at uh, different times. So here's a, a little bit more detail of what it looks like from an engineering schematic and just taking it through time. You have your individual home loops, you have your mini district neighborhood loops that those connect to, and then all the neighborhood loops connect to your, your, your larger district loop. You go through different modes of operation. So if you're in the heating mode, again, there's very little heat required from the ground. Uh, you don't need the district loop. So what happens is the homes are controlled so that all the water is moving through the well on their one site. It doesn't need to be connected to the district, so you don't need all the energy for operating the district. The district is shut down, so you are you are operating locally during those periods of time. Uh, this would be a January, February kind of condition. When you get into March, now you get into a condition where most homes may be requiring heating, but maybe you do have a home that requires cooling. Again, because you're operating locally, that's just the reversing valve and that person's unit switching. 
and you can have some homes that are in heating mode, some homes that are in cooling. Now you get into April or May and everybody is requiring some level of, of cooling. We call that stage one of cooling. Uh, all your homes can continue to operate locally until such time that you know you can, can't get any more out of your local well. And again, you cannot handle your peak cooling with your local well. At this time, you enter stage two. And in stage two, your neighborhood district loop is now flowing water. And all the water within that loop becomes a it becomes a heat sink that the homes can share energy with. They can put energy to and take energy from, but it's still doing that without the, the big district system running. Till you get to stage three, when you really get to that peak, this is your July and August condition where, you know, even though you're sharing with your neighborhood homes, the fact that every home only has one borehole, you're still a little bit shy of, of all the cooling you might need. And then and only then, to the district pumps and cooling towers and, and that turn on uh, to be able to handle that, that shaving the peak of the loads. Now, when you get into that uh, into that pump house and into those cooling towers, it's really important that uh, you know those elements be selected at the most efficient condition that they can be. Although they're not operating that much of the year, uh, they still become uh, an energy consumer. Uh, one of the big advantages of here is here's an actual diagram of the pump house with the cooling towers because, again, these uh, these home sites are built out over potentially a couple of years. There's no need to go and buy all this equipment on day one. Uh, so this equipment can be staged where you have an initial installation and, and then you, uh, in a modular way, phase in the other equipment uh, as the loads increase over time. So for Whisper Valley, uh, you know, here's some photographs, um, beautiful homes, beautiful landscape. Uh, there's a educational center that tells you all about how the geothermal and PV and, and organic uh, farming, uh, you know, works. Uh, and uh, and uh, some of the, the pros and cons here, from a pro standpoint, significant and efficient improvements over what people would typically do, which is an air-cooled heat pump system, as much as a 300% uh, increase in efficiency. Uh, the way we approached it, we didn't require that separate land area for a well field. Uh, there was a large reduction in the number of wells that we needed, a 45% decrease because of the shared energy condition. Uh, we have the ability to use the diversity in empty homes and differing uh, peak times. We have the ability to balance loads uh, for prolonged long-term efficiency because of the introduction of the, of the pump house and cooling towers. And then we have the ability to phase uh, installation for the larger equipment over time. Some of the cons is, again, putting a, a simple air-cooled heat pump uh, is a fairly inexpensive thing to do. So this is a larger initial capital investment. It's infrastructure that must be installed ahead of home construction. It still requires some additional land for your cooling tower pump house installation. It requires a uh, Increased coordination because now you, your geothermal utility has to run along all the other utilities that, that feed a, a residential community. And now you require a, an agreement, a covenant uh, between the geothermal utility provider and the homeowner. Uh, you know, they are uh, connected to a utility system. So um, uh, there is, um, you know, uh, the, 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 there needs to be a, a separation between where the homes system leaves off and where the district system picks up and, and who maintains what. So, so uh, before I get into the questions and answers, I, I just want to bring up the fact that we do have another uh, high performing buildings uh, webinar series coming up. That's high performance schools that make the grade that will be presented by our own uh, Kevin Cahill principal in the DC office. Uh, I don't have the exact date for that yet. I believe it's within the next uh, two or three weeks. We'll send an email out with that, but keep your eyes open for that. Uh, there are a number of uh, high performance schools planned for our region. So I believe there'll be some good information for, for all uh, to be had within that presentation. So, so with that, uh, I will see if I can look here to see if anybody has posted any questions. It might give me a second uh, to do so.
All right, so one question that was posted, they said, if Whisper Valley uh, was in DC, uh, how many fewer boreholes? Um, again, it's a, a, a little bit of a, a tricky question. Uh, there would be fewer uh, because the peak uh, conditions uh, for, for cooling in Washington, DC uh, should be a little bit less than, than that in uh, Texas, but, but, but not by that much. Uh, so I, I don't necessarily think that there would be uh, a huge difference in the number of wells, but what I would say is that uh, because of the the fact that we uh, do get quite a bit colder uh, here in the wintertime, uh, a system uh, installed in Washington, D.C. would be uh, much more balanced than a system uh, in a, um, you know, in a climate uh, in the southern states. So, you know, the problem with geothermal in, in New England is that they require too much heat from the ground. The problem in the southern states is they require uh, too much heat to be put into the ground. You get into the mid-Atlantic, you, you actually begin to see that sort of sweet spot where you, you, you have a much balanced, uh, um, you know, long-term condition. All right, uh, I see another question that says, uh, how do you close the gap between ground temperature and, and comfort temperature in the winter? Okay, so again, um, the, uh, the these heat pumps uh, can do uh, a uh, a very good job uh, in, uh, in in terms of providing enough heat to the loops as long as as long as they are balanced, uh, meaning as long as you are not always taking heat out and, and not putting the heat back in. Uh, the the problem with an air cooled heat pump is that on the day when you need the most amount of heat, when it's zero degrees outside, that's the time the air has the least amount of heat to give. And in our area of the country, you usually find that it's not enough. So when you see an air uh, uh, air heat pump system uh, serving a building in our area of the country, you quite often see an added electric resistant heat or some other additive heat to make up the fact that you just can't get that much heat out of the air. You don't have that problem with a ground, uh, a ground uh, heat pump type system. So it's, it's much easier to maintain those comfort without uh, having to put excess energy from somewhere else. Next question is that Texas development, how much of the home's energy do you foresee being offset by the 260 wells? All right, so um, again, uh, if, uh, just in rough terms, you know, the air condition, the energy associated with air conditioning in a home is more than half. And if we then say that, you know, we can uh, use a third of the energy in a, in a geosystem versus a, a um, uh, versus an air system, then I think you could say that uh, just using that one system, you could easily reduce uh, the energy consumption by uh, about a sixth. Uh, so next question, expected coefficient of performance uh, for Whisper Valley system. I don't have that number uh, at, at my fingertips, but we uh, will take all these questions and we will respond with a, a document that has all questions and all answers, and I will uh, try to, uh, to bring that up. Uh, Next question was, would you ever put uh, boreholes uh, under the roads if the jurisdiction wanted to? Uh, that, that can be quite tricky, uh, just, just getting the agreements of, of all those, uh, um, you know, it, it, I would say it's usually better to keep, keep them on land that you fully control. Uh, it gets complicated when you get into easements and locations where you have right-of-ways by others, but it is technically possible from an engineering standpoint. And with that, I, I, I see there's more questions, but unfortunately we've also uh, run out of time. So I, I will follow up with uh, a Q&A document. Uh, we will also send out an email that will have a link to the video from today's presentation. And uh, as always, thank you so much for, for joining in. Please do look forward to our upcoming presentations and I hope everybody has a great day. All right, thank you so much.